The best of ACS. Ed Calderon is back, security specialist, combatives instructor as well. Ed was in, I don't know, four or five weeks ago, whatever it is, and the response was overwhelming. So I said, uh, let's get Ed back. And good to see you again, Ed. Uh, Good to see you. And now that I'm thinking about it in Mexico and the border and security and uh, Corona and how that works, uh, you were just, you were in Mexico earlier today, right? Yeah, yeah. I just uh, crossed uh, early in the morning and I've been down there for a bit, uh, kind of looking at things from the outside. Um, Yeah, it's it's surreal. Surreal what's happening. Uh, The border's all dead. Pretty much, you can get through it. And it's uh, it looks like post nine eleven, uh, like border weights. There's no border weights at all. Um, nobody's crossing. Everything's closed, basically. Typically, at least as I recall, it was a long wait to get out, not as long to get in. I guess that's sort of how the metaphor for how it works. But I mean, it's typically how long uh, on average? You know, a weekday, you're going to do somewhere between two or three hours if it's like during work time. Um, so anywhere, like probably two hours. Right now, it's just walk across. I ha- I, so I had an interesting discussion with the Mike August out there, which is he said very few cases of coronavirus in Mexico. Is that y- yes, true? Yes. Uh, very few cases of coronavirus in Mexico uh, reported um, and and uh, no death, death reported, you know, government numbers. And also, actually, I... Since I'm a since I'm a security analyst, I have to go and kind of not go by the government numbers and talk mm-hmm. to some people in the in the healthcare industry, and they're mm-hmm. saying that it's not it's not yet at a at a at a uh, at a crisis level thing down there. Like there's reported cases of it, but you know realistically, it's uh, it's not anywhere the levels that it is in the U.S. So, Mike, you know the theme <clears throat> that I was kind of on to today, just in general, was. Um, your immune system and how we're killing our immune system with all the Purell. And then Mike said, "Eh, Mexicans, you know, they don't go to the hospital every time they get a sore throat and get all the drugs pumped into them. Like, like we do, we get antibiotics. Our kids at age four start getting antibiotics pumped into them. Yeah. I feel like the average Mexicans rubbing a little dirt on it and getting back to the job site. Right. So you think, that has something to do with it. I mean, uh, just a di- dietary, dietary wise, a bunch of organ meat gets eaten down there. Organ meat, right? A lot of people eat in the street, so you know all of the uh, all of the bacteria. Um, right. Yes, uh, Mexicans will only go to the hospital if they're missing a limb and it's bleeding. That's you know usually usually it's a very extreme case where Mexicans go to the hospital. Um, I think definitely the exposure to a lot of these things, the meat down there is way different than up here. Like, uh, people often ask me like, Hey, why, why are the tacos different in the U S than in Mexico? Uh, Me- Mexico doesn't uh, bleed the meat. So there's a lot of bloody meat. Like when you talk about raw meat, mm-hmm. like bloody meat, Mexico mm-hmm. leaves it bloody. You know, a lot of that stuff, uh, kind of, I think has, has some sort of factor in, in how people's gut health is just different down there. Uh, yeah, they're, you know, I mean, to, to, to make an analogy, and this kind of works in Mexico, too, um, these are street dogs, junkyard dogs, mutts, you know, they, in the back alleys and sleeping in the dirt and that kind of stuff. And those kind of dogs are always healthier than the purebreds, who are the lap dogs. And that's what we are. We're everyone's fucking lap dog. Now, we're, you know, we're more hygienic, cleaner, whatever. We're not sleeping out in the junkyard, but Mexico's probably more of that. And that dog, that that dog always lives longer and is always healthier. Yeah, uh, it, like uh, I'm uh, going to uh, Guadalajara this weekend. Guadalajara, they have this drink down there. Um, it's basically made of uh, uh, fermented maize, right? It just looks like dirty Tijuana River water. Fermented corn. Yeah. Does it have alcohol? Uh, you can get to that point mm-hmm. if you leave it out there a little bit, but mostly if you buy it like in one of the open air markets, it doesn't. I took uh, two friends of mine down there, former SF guys, right? You know, snake eaters. Mm-hmm. They had the same drink as I had, and uh, 
you know, different reactions stomach wise. SF guys, that special uh, yes, forces, special forces guys down right. there, like uh, you know, retired guys, but. They all all of us had the same drink from the same place, and, and it affected the gringos. Yeah, the gringos had it really bad, you know. Uh, Moctezuma, you know, Moctezuma was a uh, well, it, you know, if you kind of revenge, yeah, if you kind of think about the coronavirus <clears throat> not affecting that group, it possibly as greatly as it affects us or Italy or some place like that. Maybe that's some. He also. Um, Mike also brought up blood type that yeah. sounded kind of interesting. Yeah, you know, it's the things you hear, and I'm no scientist or anything like that, but you hear things, and 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 you know, right now they're talking about O types being less, uh, less, uh, less affected. Well, not if not not uh, not affected, but less affected as far as the symptoms. Uh, from this virus than A types. Right? And does Mexico have more? Mexico O-types? has more O types, right? So it may be a factor. You know, it's it's a new thing. People are learning from it, right? It might be a factor. <clears throat> Last time you were here, we were talking about personal security, and you were talking about online presence, and you know, people think in terms of brass knuckles or parking in a lit parking structure or something, but then think about that the online thing. Um, and I thought that was interesting. Now there's a kind of different kind of security. It's food and provisions and things of that nature. Do you have, I know it's not your field of expertise or survival skills, um, more survival in the street and a little less over the course of two months. But do you have thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we were laughing at preppers and we were laughing at people that have hordes of ammunition and guns and stuff like that. Now you see lines of uh, people outside of gun stores in LA. Uh, you see a rush on cannery and uh, you see people talking about preserves and going kind of old school with some of these things. And I used to make my own jerky because I'm Mexican, you know? Right. And I keep can like I eat sardines because that's how I grew up eating sardines and it was like a poor man's food. But now apparently it's like a like a valued survival skill. So I'm from the third world, so a lot of the stuff that people are doing now to kind of prepare for it, like they, that you would consider prepping, is are things that we did because that's how you live, you know? Is Mexico considered third world? Uh, a lot of parts of it are considered third world. Uh, for for a while, we had the richest man in the world. Uh, Carlos Slim was a Mexican for a while, so mm-hmm. it's a pretty contrasting uh, contrasting parts in Mexico. Uh, what I what I would say as far as security wise, uh, panic is more dangerous probably than the virus. I agree. Uh, and the types of things that happen when people panic, like shortages. Um, uh, violence at uh, places where things are dispensed or dispersed. Um, people acting crazy. You know, I yeah. think the, the the danger factor in this uh, this whole situation is other humans. You know, right? Realistically, I, I'm 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 with you. Also, you know, 150 dead people is a zero burger, pretty much in our world and um, in every world and every world that came before us. You know, we're just pampered more soft and we can panic because we can yeah. you know i mean maybe <clears throat> maybe panicking is a luxury yeah and uh we have you know, it is a luxury like if you think about it like you have to have many things have to sort of be in place to to, to hoard toilet paper you need tons of stores and tons of toilet paper and yeah. Maybe maybe Mexico, maybe they just haven't worked their way up to get soft enough to panic. Yeah, well, that supply chain, uh, people people still, you know, people still eat lots more parts of the cow than up here, you know. We, we have uh, we have tribe tacos, which are basically the intestinal tract of the animal. And uh, that's considered, you know, that's... You, you got menudo. The, yeah, menudo, right? <clears throat> and uh, so I think we make, uh, we make things, we make uh, things work better. You know, a bit longer, stretch out our resources down there a little bit more. I was talking to a doctor, and we we're talking about the immune system, and he was talking about eating more organ meat and how that helped your immune system. Yeah. We don't eat a lot of, you know, liver yeah. and guts and heart and stuff I mean, like that. We don't do that out here. There's good bacteria. Uh, also, you see people making a run on water. Well, I don't know, man. I've, I've, I've boiled water for a long time, and I, that works. And just common sense is uncommon today which is weird do you have to do you have to boil water in mexico 
at times, yes. Like uh, you, you guys, and this is something I always laugh at Americans. You know, I'm you know I'm up here. I'm new. You guys bathed bathe in drinkable potable water. Right. right. That's, that's, mm. that's, I don't. I go in the swimming pool, but yes, <laughs> most people do. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome if you can. Uh, but down there, you know, you open up the tap and it's not, it's not, so, well, you know, Mexicans do drink out of the, the tap sometimes. And that's probably why they have, you know, uh, street dog stomachs. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you boil water down there in some places, you know, to kill everything. Uh, uh, Oregon meat, by the way, Chris is writing this, is um, very nutrient dense. It's uh, 10 times more potent than uh, vitamin E, one of the most powerful antioxidants available. So there you go. We don't eat organ meat. Yeah. You do eat yeah, <clears throat> a lot of it. organ meat. A lot of it. Uh, you know, some, sometimes <clears throat> when I travel in the south of the uh, the U.S., they try to scare me with things like shitlands or stuff like that. Like, right. hey, you want some shitlands? Like, yeah. More, just give me some Cholula so I can you know, spice it up. Right. It's like this is nothing, you know. It'll be. Uh, I'll be interested to figure out the groups that uh, eat more of that and live more that way. How they're affected. So, um, you said off the air. There's people going in from the United States into shop. Yeah, into yeah. Tijuana. They're not buying bandito puppets no. or plaster of Paris ET with a Prussian helmet on it <laughs> or Pittsburgh Steelers bomber jacket that has the Steelers misspelled. Yeah, is, is it yeah. that shit or is it or is it Costco well, shit? That's 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 some deep knowledge of the. Uh, I told you, stuff. spent a lot of time in Tijuana. <laughs> that's deep knowledge of Thank the bootleg you. stuff. Yeah, just don't describe the donkey show or people are going to get freaked out. Doesn't exist. I looked. Well, I oh, looked for it. oh, really? <laughs> oh, does it, sir? I was on foot. I have a, I have an image that I can't show, obviously, and I have a story that we'll we'll talk about. I'm, that later. I'm writing that down. <laughs> I I actively looked for hours for a well, donkey show. Well, it's uh, it's like <clears throat> one of those things that appears like a rainbow every now and then, and uh, oh, I have an image and uh, a story. Like, okay. Obviously, the image I can only show you, mm -hmm. uh, but the I story. just wrote down donkey show. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, the the Americans are crossing in droves uh, to stock on all the necessities that are not. Uh, available up here um toilet paper canned goods you know amazing seeing uh some very caucasian individuals that don't speak any spanish uh with a cart full of uh, canned menudo you know wow. That's like, like wow that's pretty insane um are there any rules in mexico about price gouging or anything yeah, price like gouging not 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 no <clears throat> but now they're they're putting rules as far as the uh, 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 per person sales of, of uh toilet toilet paper and cleaning products right mm -hmm. so you know weird things because it, it's been happening in steps so on the u.s side you saw this panic and on the mexican side there was no panic so like some of my american friends were like hey is there toilet paper down there like, yeah there's a lot you know, can you get us some? It's like that's a weird request, but sure. Is is there? So here, I mean, look, there's a border just arbitrarily runs through the desert, basically, and you know, one side's Tijuana and the other side's El Cajon or San Diego or whatever. It's right there, and San Diego's you know pretty white, pretty gentrified, and probably pretty panicked. And then twenty feet over, there's a place that's not that panicked. Yeah. Um, if we're at a nine in the panic department here in the, with the gringos in the blue eyed devils here in the United States, what would you say Mexico is? Uh, we're probably at a three, maybe, uh, maybe a three. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, there's a lot of, the world has ended for Mexico more times, I think in recent history than the U S. So that's why we're pretty chill with some of this type of stuff. There, is there also a spiritual side of it, which is they're yeah. probably more religious. And yeah, they probably figure like uh, the Virgin Guadalupe is going to protect me. Yeah, there's a lot of Catholicism down there. There's a lot of uh, you know, there's a lot of weird occult uh, also religions down there. People kind of uh, uh, you know, have faith in a lot of things down there. The faith is definitely a big thing. You see lines of people at the pharmacy and lines of people at the witches market in Tijuana. You know, witches market. Yeah, what is that? Uh, uh, near the cathedral in Tijuana, uh, near uh, the, at the center of Tijuana, there's a there's a big market uh, that has a has a big shop there. They call it the witches. Well, my, I call it the witches market. Uh, basically, herbs, uh, just a bunch of Santa Muerte. Like, there's a big uh, Reaper statue there that uh, people put candles to. So Grim Reaper. Yeah. Uh, 
It's, or just Reaper. <laughs> we only have a Grim Reaper. Yeah, right well, uh, I think the Green Reaper up here is kind of viewed as a guy. In Mexico, it's a it's a it's a female. It's a God basically damn right, them bitches. Yeah, They're the ones are going to take you. <laughs> it's a female it's a good deity. Point. It's a female deity. I right? don't compliment the Mexicans that often, but I think this one they got right. <laughs> Well, they're also kind of obsessed with death, right? Like lots of um, depictions of it. And, you know, like I could remember as a kid, like people coming back from Tijuana and they had the skeleton puppet, like very into like skeleton kind of Halloween-y stuff. The, the, the relationship we have down there with death is completely different than the U.S., you know, even how we bury our dead. Let's let's talk about that for a second. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, mm. wakes, you know. Um, most of my, a lot of my family members that passed away had their wakes at their houses. And I, and, and well, before I was 14, 15, I had seen a lot of dead bodies in my life and touched a lot of dead bodies. Touched. Yeah. And it was. Why touched? Uh, because when you lay somebody down, uh, it's customary to go over there, give them a kiss in the forehead or, mm -hmm. or, or grab their hands, uh, in the coffin and mm -hmm. put flowers in there. Mm. It's customary. You can right. touch a dead. It's not. It's not like a taboo thing. Right. Also, Day of the Dead. I used to hang out at graveyards and and drink and sing with mariachi music during the Day of the Dead festival festivities and sleep over at the, at the graveyards. And that's a common thing in Mexico. Right. So it's is it is it an um, okay? Let's put it to you this way. I don't know if it's it's an embracing of death or less it's, stigma yeah, or like whatever you have with organ meat you have with death. Uh, like we kind of go, I don't want to talk about that. And then you're like, no, lean into it. Yeah, I, I think uh, <clears throat> it comes from it comes from uh, the, the Catholic side of it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, Catholic symbolism and things like that. The mysteries being being uh, said several times over by the women in the group. Uh, the shaking of hands or the hugs in, in an environment like that, a lot of contact. And then on the more old school post, uh, post, uh, post colonial times, uh, death has always been a deity, even, even in Aztec times, you know, there's been, death has always been like a present constant thing there. And, and you don't see, <clears throat> we do a lot of like proclamations in this country. It's like if one person dies of the coronavirus that's one too many like we do a lot of like no child should go to bed hungry no everybody's world-class health care and stuff like that probably less of that in mexico yeah there's a lot of uh, amnesia <clears throat> down there you know we all oh, somebody forgot to do this well you know and then it happens again you know that type of stuff yeah there's not there's not a lot of proclamations happening down there you know and not not a lot of memory Oh really? Is, yeah, you know. So, so they're. We can try to figure this out. Their immune system may be sturdier, in in terms of for this kind of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> um, their diet may be a little more interesting, diverse, and there may be a little more dirt in their street tacos. And they've been this has been going on for years and years and years. Yeah. I've eaten street tacos and. Tijuana, you know what I always appreciated about the uh, street tacos in Tijuana and just the tacos and all that kind of stuff is, and I don't know if this still works this way, but you'd go in there and you just start ordering tacos. The guy would start handing you tacos, you'd just be eating tacos. Yeah. And then he wasn't charging you per taco. No, he was just giving no. you tacos and he'd give you tacos. And then at the end, it's a tally. he'd go, how many tacos did you have? And you go like, I think we had like 18 tacos. There'd be five guys, you know, and go, yeah. okay, here's how much. But I was always like, yeah, surprised that they didn't want to get paid. Like here, you know, you have to pay before you pump your gas. Yeah. Yeah. They don't trust you to pump your gas yeah. and then pay. But I thought, that's an interesting cultural thing, yeah. Because you think it might be the other way around. No. What is that? Uh, first off, the the try and you know try and pull a fast one on some of these taco guys. The, right. They, they have their the, they, these guys. El Cabong. Yeah. Also, they have big ass knives. Oh, know? El Chapo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a cultural thing, and it's also like a you know there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of communal type things like that culturally down in Mexico. It would that, be considered insulting if they yeah, asked you to pay. Yeah. And also people would look at you really bad, you know, as right. far as a business, if you like, per, like have to pay each time I get a taco, mm -hmm. it's just not how things are done down there, specifically in a taco type setting. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be in a taco esque setting. That's, a, that's when a, I'm <laughs> down there. That's my setting. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, <clears throat> we'd always eat all the street tacos and, 
go to all the strip clubs and go to all the dive w- bars. W- which, uh, w- which exactly, <clears throat> which specific strip clubs? Well, let's see. I'm picturing Revolution Street. Okay, okay. I'm picturing getting dropped off from the cab from the border yes. at sort of the front end of it. As I'm walking down Revolution, I'm seeing Margarita's Village on my left. I'm seeing the Unicorn Bar, I think, on my left. That was a downstairs yeah. strip club yeah. place. Uh, there's outdoor bars. There's like the highlight center or whatever, sort of down the stadium-y kind of thing yeah. in the middle. Does that yeah. seem about right? Yeah. I'm, I'm older than you, so yeah. you know, yeah. some of this is – Oh, it's still there. Oh. It's, the revolution died. Uh, as far as you know, it's the like, street. Died. This, I mean, it's not that happening of a nightlife down Revolution. Mm-hmm. Now it's Sixth Street, uh-huh. but the the traditional permissive part of that part of the the, the Tijuana, the Calle Primera, the first street, mm-hmm. that's all still there. You know, that's not going away. It's basically they call it a tolerance zone or a, tolerance zone or a pink zone. That's where the you have the paraditas outside, all the uh, ladies outside standing, mm-hmm. know, kind of inviting people in and. Uh, and two very famous big gentlemen's clubs that are, you know, legendary down there. Well, you know, it was funny. So we went down there with a few friends, you know, and <clears throat> we just go sit and watch the strippers. Yeah. Um, guys would eat pussy on stage. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You think you got donkey show, son? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got my own Tijuana story. Oh, that, that, let's let's hear it. Guys. <laughs> Give him a buck and she put the snatch right in the face mm. uh, on the table. I mean, boom, a live band, live band, like snare drum, yeah. trumpet with a dent in it, you know, like guys, a fucking tuba, you know, boom, 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 boom. and it's like live fucking band. Three of the oldest men you ever saw in your life, just like on the left, in the back, you know, guys down there, Marines, you yeah. know, it's drunker and shit, eating pussy. We were, uh, we were like sitting in it. Now, if you sit on the front, you got to get into it. So yeah, you yeah. sit a few back, you save your tip money. But one of my friends, he couldn't take it anymore. One of the ladies had walked by the table a few times and he said, uh, all right, I'm going back. We He had 20 bucks or yeah. something. We didn't have 20 bucks. So he went, he went back and went through like a secret door and went like upstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, we had smuggled in a bottle of booze, right? Because we weren't going to pay and buy drinks. No. It's too expensive. We'd order Cokes, you know, but then under the table, we'd be freshing them up. But our <laughs> bottle of booze we bought at the liquor store, you know. He goes upstairs. I think it's 20 bucks for either blowjob or fucking. Okay. He, <laughs> and then it's 20 bucks for like the room. So it's like, it's like, when you're down on the in the strip club, they're like twenty bucks. And he's like, okay. And then you get up top, and it's like, oh, the room's twenty bucks too. Like, so now it's it's forty bucks. Um, he starts with the blowjob. He changes his mind. Yeah. He goes for the sex. She double dips on now. Now he's into sixty bucks. This is a king's ransom for us, by the way. <laughs> we have no money, no way can we get six bucks. While he's up there changing his mind. Uh, one of the managers or guards or whatever spots us with the bottle yeah. under the table, chases us all out up the stairs, up up the revolution, because it's down like in a basement, the unicorn was. We all spill out in the street and just go scattering you know, different directions. Now the problem is the guy's like walking around out front, head on a swivel, wants to know where we are. Everyone's scattered, but our buddy's upstairs in the secret room <laughs> fucking. And he's going to come down. He's not going to know yeah. who. And by the way, the chick he ended up with, she was wider than she was tall. And she had that crazy bleach blonde hair yeah. on a Mexican almost lady. Kind of, almost kind of green. And shit oh, like yeah. It was so bad. <laughs> it was so bad. And we didn't know what to do because we knew he was going to come down and not be able to find us. But we couldn't get that close yeah. to the opening of the – I think it was a unicorn. Yeah, that's a pro- I, I know, I know, I know of that area. That's, Same that's, side of the street that Margarita's Village was on. Yeah, and a uh, bunch of other places, and then the Highlight Place. I that's think, down there. that's where the 
donkey show that I witnessed really? happen. Yeah, around that area. Well, yeah. Tell me how that worked. Wow. It was not there. You know, yeah, yeah. When we were there. Okay. So we, we asked. So people. We people. So I, I'm. I'm probably one of uh, Tijuana's most. Uh, you know, most known sons outside mm-hmm. of Tijuana. Right. So I born there. Grew up there. Always heard of this uh, show. You know, like El Chupacabras. You know, like, yeah. you know It's like sure. a legend. Mm-hmm. Never met anybody that went to one. Never saw any any of these shows out there at all. You know, I was young. We looked, man. Uh, we walked 15 we blocks. Worked, uh, I was 24 working for the government mm-hmm. and being stupid during, mm-hmm. uh, you know, downtime. Mm-hmm. I was unmarried back then, so there was like a, a thing where if you weren't married, you had to work on the, on the um, Christmas uh, era time. Mm-hmm. So me and a friend of mine uh, named Jaramillo, um, I can speak his name because he, he's, he's uh, left us. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a he was a scumbag of a person, one of those friends that you know talks you into stupid stuff. You mm-hmm. know? So he drags me down there. He says Harmi was probably in his was probably forty eight back then. You know, very mm-hmm. desperate individual. And uh, I was young. He had kids, so I was the one with money. Mm-hmm. So he dragged me down there. We we're headed towards this uh, this establishment of women. Mm-hmm. Right, it's like the Walking Dead outside, except that instead of zombies, there's women. You know, the the, yeah. the, B, the C team is outside usually. So that's what's clawing at her clothes to convince us to come into one of these establishments so you see a lot of yeah you know, a lot of a lot of you know different uh you know different types out there i you know, you know the, the other thing too when you go to tijuana is you see five-year-olds selling chiclets everywhere yeah. like young kids working and like middle-aged prostitute women like everyone's fucking working <laughs> and it's sad like it's sad to see 46 year old prostitute ladies like having to stand out in the street and it's sad to see Five-year-old girls uh, selling chiclets. Yeah, but go ahead. Uh, you know, I'm wrestling off some of these uh, claws, uh, grabbing onto me. I look back, Harmio, Harmio is French kissing all of them. You know, <laughs> and I'm like, dude, that's disgusting. He says, that's oh. like my buddy. Yeah, he says, you know, smoking a cigar. He says, it's free samples. It's free samples. <laughs> also, Harmio also had this idea that smoking would kill germs. Mm. You know, so yeah, he, which is probably right. not true, right? But you know. So I mean, we're walking towards this uh, big red establishment. That's all I'm going to say about that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's still there. People will know what I'm talking about. Uh, and somebody pulls out a sign, like a, a cardboard sign with balloons on it that said, tonight only, world famous donkey show. Mm, timing. I saw it and I was like, you know what? I'm pretty, uh, I'm one of those people that he looks at things and I, I've never seen that. No. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Skydive once type. Yeah. You know. I get it. It's a bucket list kind of thing. Yeah. So it might I, be a bucket list kind of thing for a donkey. Yeah. I mean, I'm you from Tijuana I mean? and I uh, heard about <clears> this. It's like basically somebody somebody says, uh, we captured a little chupacabras and we have them occasionally here. We want to see them. It's like, of course, let's go see. Yeah. There's no judgment here, Ed. <laughs> so I, I'm the guy who looked for the donkey show for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> so look back at Jaramillo. Jaramillo's French kissing some lady and he smokes and he says, you know, he you know, signals to the entrance, says, let's go. You know, right, because he was he was always down for stuff. Walk in there, you have to buy a pail of beer to sit down there. It's like a, you have to consume, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, it was you know sawdust on the ground, smelled like a hamster cage. Mm-hmm. The, the house, the, the place was kind of crooked. It's a weird, right. weird place. Slide, just a, sl- a rusty old slide. They probably stole from some amusement uh, park or something. Mm-hmm. Ladies come out, start dancing, you know. Uh, not, Live band music? Uh, no, no. It was like a DJ, like a mm. DJ with, yeah. with vinyls and mm-hmm. cassettes. Still, you uh-huh. know, that was like weird. It's a, it's a weird place. It's yeah. kind of stuck in time. Uh, not the best uh, quality, you know, of an in entertainment the department. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I turned over to Harmi, and Harmi was all into it, inviting chicks over. Mm-hmm. Like, like inviting some for me. It's like, no, Harmi, yeah, this, yeah. this is this is all you, right? Uh, you know what? It's a tourist trap. Let's leave. Army was like, just give it a chance. When he said that, the lights went out. All the lights went out. You know? Pitch black. Pitch black. Careless whisper comes out. <laughs> was it? Was it one of the downstairs type yeah, yeah, things? Yeah, yeah. So you're like in a basement. So you're waiting for the gimp. Like yeah. It, when it goes dark, it is it, dark. It, There's it, no windows. It went dark as dark can be, and all of us. I was in immediate panic mode. You know, grab onto Harmio's shoulder. We go into like a you know defensive position in right. there. And Careless Whisper comes on, mm-hmm. you know, that mm-hmm. you know, uh, that's, that's the song just comes on and it's very interesting. A lady comes out dressed like Jessica Rabbit. 
Wow. She did not look like Jessica Rabbit, by no, the way. No, but she, but she had the wig and the dress, you know, mm-hmm. the gloves. You know, mm-hmm. uh, what would you? What would be the last thing you would take off if that was your strip costume? Uh, <laughs> contact lenses. She, the, the wig was the first thing to go. She takes the first. Why is she taking the wig off? No, that that, that, the wig that should have been like a warning sign of things yeah. to come. Mm-hmm. So through the wig, uh, you know, Harmia grabbed the wig and smelled it, which I thought was <laughs> one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. We should do a whole segment on who the horny guy is. <laughs> Because my buddy, still alive, I won't use his name, he was the horny guy. Like, you know, we, like, there are some guys that are more animal than human. Yeah. And, like, when that roly-poly fat chick with the peroxide hair came by the table, we were like, ah, fuck no. And he was like, let's get it on, baby. <laughs> like, Jaramillo. He's like, those dudes, right? Yeah, he's... Uh, I'm, he, I'm jealous, by the way. I'm well, not judging. Well, you know, they usually don't last long in life. Mm. That's uh, my main thing. So... He smells the wick. Yeah, it's like, right. you know, it's like that's disgusting, and he t- right. like he push, pushes it forward so I can smell mm-hmm. it too. I'm like, that's disgusting. Mm-hmm. <sighs> this, this is a horrible story. Uh, so, you know, she signals to these two individuals that are standing on opposite sides of the stage that now is the time. You know that mm-hmm. the nod. Mm-hmm. And I thought there was going to be like two guys dressed as a donkey or or a pinata donkey or something. It was a live gray eeyore looking donkey, mm-hmm. like a, like a sad. His eyes were dead, you know, soulless <laughs> animal, you know, like one of those lines that has uh, in the circus. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Careless Whisper is playing in the background. Oh, still. God, I love it. So they, uh, she looks at the crowd of people looking. It was just us and like two other people. In them. Mm-hmm. And she, she, so she focuses on us for the show mm-hmm. for some reason, because we're probably because we were the only ones there right. kind of sitting center stage. And she looks at us and starts stroking this donkey's back, and then she signals again to these two guys. So they grab the donkey by the legs and flip it over like a party table. Really? Yes. Yes. And again, there's an image. Right? Yeah. So, um, so they flip it over like a party table, hold it on each side. Hold the legs. Hold the legs on each side mm-hmm. so the animal doesn't move around. Surprisingly, mm-hmm. the animal was like... I probably some sort of influence of some sort of substance. We probably been through this a few times. Yeah, he looked like a you know he looked like he's you know his eyes you could see like Vietnam veterans you know right. his eyes were just flames. thousand yard stare. Um, so she 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 took off one of her shoes and used her foot to awaken him. He became tumescent. Yes. Uh, so she started stroking with her foot. Yes. Mm-hmm. By the way. <laughs> Here's how you know when a story's made up and a story isn't made up. There's a bunch of specific shit that doesn't make sense. Like Jessica Rabbit took the wig off first. Your buddy sniffed the wig, used her foot, you know, didn't use her mouth or whatever. Like it's just it's real specific shit that you don't get in normal stories or made up stories. Sorry. So this thing starts coming to life, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, she kneels down. Like a bone caster, which, you know, just like those, like that squat that mm-hmm. some of these bone casters do mm-hmm. and grabbed it. Mm. And you could see the animal did not with like her that. hand or yeah, just her hand mm-hmm. looks at us both with like, just, you know, like now this is what you paid for. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And, you know, it go like, I didn't know if it was going in, it was going back in. No, she put it in and just leaned back like a like a like if she was on like a sled. She's facing the she's, back of the donkey. No, she's facing the, the front of the donkey, sitting on and just you know leaning back, leaning back, leaning back. And I was like, look over Harmio. Harmio's by this point, his cigarette is out, stuck to his lip, and he's like <laughs> open mouth like this. <laughs> right. So, so I uh, I looked at the situation, looked around, and you know what? Said you know what? Nobody's going to believe me. So I grabbed my Nextel phone, mm-hmm. had a camera on it. Uh, using all my training, uh, you know, ninja government training, I slid the phone up my chest. Oh. And the biggest camera flash ever coming out of a phone lit this <laughs> smoke-filled room <laughs> and lit this the red-eyed lady on top of this animal. The animal, everybody looked at me. Like the guys holding the donkey just did one of these. Mm. The lady on top of the donkey was like, and yeah. the donkey, like everyone looked. Everybody looked over at me, and my friend says, "What? What's wrong with you? Like, what? 
what you're sick, man. You take a picture of these. What's wrong right. with you? Like, oh, yeah. Carmillo is disgusted with my behavior at this point. He's the bastion of morality. He's, he's at the donkey show smoking. He, he takes a cigarette out, steps out. You're sick, man. He, he leaves me in there sitting mm. down. Uh, waiter comes over and says, sir, you have to, you have to leave. I'm looking at this whole situation. Look at what's happening in front of me. I have to leave. Right. Yes, you have to leave. So, you know, I got kicked out. I got kicked out of a donkey show. I was outside <laughs> and Harami was like, are you sick, man? Are you sick? This is sick behavior, taking pictures. <laughs> like, I just wanted a picture. To, nobody was going to believe me. I said, you're a sick person, you know? <laughs> so You have the picture? I do have the picture. I have to look at it. Look I'll, I'll let you look <laughs> for it. Um, Hermio. How did Hermio. he? How, Hermio. Hermio. Yeah. How did he meet his demise? Uh, you know, I left the job and I stopped looking after him. Uh, and he kind of went uh, went off on a tangent. And uh, it, uh, again, he, he lived a great life. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I, when he was... When we did, when he was at his funeral, like when we did his funeral, I said to, I asked one of my uh, one of the guys at work to to accommodate the family at the funeral, and everything like that. Got there and like, hey, uh, where's the Harmia's family? Oh, they're in front. Looked over there. That's not his family. It's like I, I don't know those people. Mm. Harmia had a secret family. Mm. They had two families. That's yeah. that's you know that's how those guys roll. Nine kids all in, all in total. So I don't think. Uh, how old was he when he died? It's probably fifty five. I what, think. What He's got like, him? Uh, he was shot. He was shot outside his house. By, by cartel guys. Because of what? Mm, you know who knows. You know I, I left the job, kind of lost lost track of him, and he got shot outside of his house. Do you think he was? Not taking the silver and taking the lead instead, or do you uh, think he was probably, crossing lines? He's probably he's probably on somebody's payroll, and the counter guys got him. Probably, yeah. Mm. <laughs> wow, that's the story of Hermio. Yeah, that, yeah, and the donkey. Yeah, and the you know the uh, moral of that story is you can be in a room with a donkey show happening and Hermio next sitting next to you, and somehow you're the scumbag of that story <laughs> because you got kicked out. All right, we'll take a, a quick break. We'll come back with the uh, ad and get into all kinds of. Uh, all things Mexico and security right after this. All right, back with uh, Ed Calderon. Edsmanifesto.com is where you go. That's the uh, website, Twitter and Instagram at Ed's Manifesto as well. Um, so let's see. Security, Mexico, what's going on? I, I did not know <clears throat> we're going to take a big dive into sort of the uh, – Corona, ironically, virus and Mexico, but I found that stuff to be super interesting. Um, last we spoke, we talked about the cartels and how broad the reach was. And we think of the cartels as existing in Mexico, but not having a, a footprint out here. Yeah. Uh, but they're franchising. Yeah. I want to, I want you to think about w what realistically we should fear or think about as far as the cartels in the United States and what they may be involved with that we don't even know they're involved with here. And, um, can't believe we went so long without really talking about cartels, but let's uh, get us caught up. What what in the U.S. is the cartels up to that the average American is not aware of? Well, last time I talked about the new generation cartel and then uh, a bit after that, there's a big DEA operation across the country that targeted them specifically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the head of the uh, new generation cartel, uh, El Mencho, as they call him, um, he his daughter showed up to a hearing of uh, his brother, again, Mencho's son, and got caught. Uh, that probably led into a series of things and information explo exploitation stuff. So 600 uh, cartel members across the country got uh, rolled up and in that uh, whole after operation. Uh, 600 new generation cartel members, apparently, uh, or people related to that uh, organization, which is unheard of because most of the past uh, counter cartel operations in the U.S. have always targeted Sinaloa. Right, mm -hmm. so it means that there's a thriving, growing presence of this new, uh, different cartel in on stateside, basically uh, between money laundering, 
uh, moving money around, uh, drug distribution, uh, trafficking, you know, smuggling weapons down to Mexico. Uh, now there's two players in the country working kind of uh, kind of um, uh, against each other, right? Yeah. What do they think or how tapped into politics are they? You know, I watched a Democratic debate and it's like a competition to who's going to do less enforcement. Like Biden's like, well, I'm not – if, when I'm in charge, nobody's getting deported. Nobody's going anywhere. The first hundred days, no deportations. After that, only violent criminals are going to be like, he's like basically sh- shouting from the mountain, yeah. like, hey, I'm not doing anything. So yeah. come on down and, and hang out. Or is that how they perceive it? Or what are they? Yeah. But, where are yeah, they with it? You know, speaking to some people that are, were part of that life and some people like for interviews that I've done. Uh, that that's that's why you see the, mostly their cartel presence or the, the kind of the where it's rooted. You see it more in Democrat, you know, Democrat uh, ruled kind of uh, states, so well, California, it, Chicago, w- permissive states like that. Well, why w- hey, look if if it's a if you're called a sanctuary city and you've declared war on ICE and said, you know, we're not turning anyone over to ICE who gets arrested and we're not going to arrest or deport anyone unless they commit felonies or violent felonies. Well, whatever the subject is, why wouldn't you just migrate there? Why wouldn't you just hang out where it's a little little easier to get along? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And, I mean, it's permissive and it's usually th- those are the places where these things grow or they take root. You know, it used to be that most Americans, even some of the government uh groups that I kind of advised or, or worked with had this uh, misconception of uh, cartels being a Mexico kind of organization problem. It's not. It's, it's a regional problem. They're rooted in the U.S. American born, uh, holding American passports, some of these members now, uh, with American companies, legit American companies working through some of these legit American companies. Uh it's not like they're going to get caught and get deported to Mexico or something like that, which is, again, one of the weird things sometimes people say or comment on that. You now, these guys, why, why build a wall? Why are, they, why are we letting them into this country? I mean, they were born. A lot of them were actually born in the U.S., right? Mm. So a lot of that money that's being made in illicit drugs on the U.S. side is no longer not. It's not not a lot of it is not getting smuggled back down to Mexico. A lot of it's staying up here. A lot of the money staying yeah. up here. So it, that means that there's a thriving cartel. Uh, just the, the gestation period of a cartel in the U.S. has already passed. The 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 the, 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 the thing has hatched. It's already here, and it's uh, it's alive and well. This uh, this recent operation that's just the tip of the iceberg. A lot of the guys that got caught were kind of related to the financial side of it and distribution. Uh, but like all these groups, there's always you know command enforcement. You know, I didn't see a lot of uh, a lot of guns get, get confiscated uh, in this recent operation. Uh, the amounts I saw of money and drugs, you know, they're I don't know. For, that's a lot of people and very little material that they got 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 from it. Um, Seeing more managerial, as they would say, in uh, No Country for Old Men. Yeah, like. These weren't the street enforcers. They didn't have the drugs and no, have the guns. I, I know for a fact that some, of, specifically this new generation cartel, is highly militarized and in, in it's kind of uh, in the ways they do things. It's not like the Sinaloa cartel. It's not. Well, describe that. So they, but, uh, simple, uh, an example: uh, the new generation cartel has training camps, mm-hmm. like uh, you know. We talk about the ISIS tra- training camps or the Al Qaeda training camps with the monkey bars. Mm-hmm. Well, the New Generation Cartel has things like that down south, where they bring in people on their false pretenses of uh, getting a job in a security job or something like that, and then bring in people from the U.S. No, bring in people in from Mex in Mex from Mexico. Uh, you know, ex police guys, ex military guys. Mm-hmm. Some of the guys that I used to work with uh, left the job and went to work for the, some of those cartels down there. And some of these people have clear English like I do. They have college degrees. Um, they have a lot of training uh, on both sides of the border. Um, they, they are things to, you know, individuals that are, you know, dangerous guys, basically, uh, for the skill sets they have. They have made it a point to invest in their people in that way. So there's there's camps where these guys train, you know, long-range shooting um, training out there in Mexico somewhere. 
going into these camps where there's just thousands of spent rounds. So these guys have been practicing shooting. Um, they've knocked down uh, uh, that that is public at least one or two helicopters from the federal government. So they're, so they're aware of anti-aircraft uh, materials and how to use it, right? Yeah, they've shot down uh, governmental helicopters from Mexico yeah. who have come over their camp. Yeah, it was in a city. It was it was in uh, Jalisco, the Jalisco cartel. They basically had knocked down a federal helicopter that was – where are they getting? Operation. Where are their weapons coming from? Uh, all over. Um, a lot of you know. There's a lot of uh, gun advocates that kind of point out quickly that there's no way they could have uh, procured a, a rocket launcher from a gun show. Mm -hmm. uh, they're coming. F they are American. American made. Uh, usually, some of these things come from South America. Things that you, as a America, sold to some South South, South American countries or guerrilla forces. That that type of stuff. So That's, this is. Supplies, yeah, from um, weapons yeah. from the U.S. sold to somebody in South America under the pretenses of well, they're not the bad guys, yeah. And then those guys went and sold it to yeah. the bad and guys, they're, and they're and coming up, you know, not just not, but America is not the only source of guns in Mexico. There's, there's, and I saw all sorts of weird things down there, you know, uh, uh, Soviet block stuff, uh, Soviet uh, uh, surface to air stuff. How come no one has shot down a commercial airliner with one of those well, in the U.S.? I don't, I, I don't know. There was a worry about that. It, I, it should be. Well, so there's I, we, I was I personally saw two things that are capable of doing that type of thing. Weapons. Yeah, rocket launchers, basically surface air missile type uh, things down across the border from San Diego, right? So they're they're out close there. to San Diego. Yeah, they're just it's like five minutes from San Diego, so they're out there, you know. But uh, you know, cartels are not terrorist groups. Uh, yeah, cartels not, not, not don't, traditionally. They don't want that kind of heat. No, no, no. They do use terror though, <laughs> but they're not that type of terror. You know, they're not just uh, in it for violence to make violence. You know, that's, right? Everything. Everything for them is to benefit them financially. Their yeah, their business. Right. So yeah. they're not Middle East terror. They're no. business terror. Yeah. They're they're yeah. They're exactly. They're 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 uh, narco terrorism is a different animal. I know some people, you know, uh, say that cartels are not terrorist groups uh, because they don't have that political element to them. They very much do. There's a lot of political candidates in Mexico who have been killed by cartels because they want to have politics go one side or the other. So they definitely are, and I think, and most Mexicans will agree that they are terrorist groups, but not religious motivated. They're motivated by the religion of money mostly. Where's MS thirteen fall into any? Of really, this realistically, stuff? they don't. Uh, they don't figure in Mexico as a group, as any group of influence in Mexico. You know, they they get used usually, and uh, by other uh, bigger groups down there. As for muscle, as for muscle, and not even you know, usually not even that. You know, um, the problem is that uh, they have they have their colors on their skin, so it's not some they can't be. They're discreet. tatted, all they're all yeah. marked up, yeah. so you can't really use them because they're so easily made. Also, right? we we have a surplus of young people in Mexico. We don't need them. They they don't, they're realistically they don't need. To yeah, a surplus get of seventeen year old dudes who'll do anything for a hundred bucks. Mexico is a country of young people. So there's a lot. There's a, there's a lot of them. So you, you, you like most of these cartels you'll see, and now every now and then you'll see pic, uh, videos and pictures of uh, you know kids, kid, kid age like 15, 13 year olds with AKs on the back of trucks. So I mean, you know, there's no age limit, and there's a lot of them. You know, it's a, the, the recruiting is not a problem down there. How does recruiting work? Well, there's two. There's a few ways. One, it's a family business, so you get dragged in in there by a family member that's already in. Mm -hmm. Uh, two, it's something you look for. So you go in and work uh, from the ground up. You know, we start off maybe in a, as an alcon, which is basically a lookout. Mm -hmm. They give you a radio, give you a phone. And if you see anything in this area, government related, just let us know. And they have people like that all over the place, right? So it makes operations against them pretty hard because, you know, you see a you know 12 year old kid with a smartphone, like in a street corner, and you see the army pass and You'll see them take out the phone, call it in, so everybody disperses. Right. So that's how you, that's most of these people get get a start in, in the life that way. Yeah, you start as a spotter, uh, drug mule uh, work. You know, basically moving drugs from one point to another. 
uh, working working security for some of the grows, and then you work your way up to being a bodyguard and then an enforcer and maybe a sicario. You know, basically being a hard killer for some of these people, some of these groups. Um, that's one an way, and the last way is people get kind of uh, corralled into it. Like New Generation Cartel is kind of famous for that. People get offered jobs as a security um, agent or uh, officer in a private company, and all of a sudden you're in a field somewhere and you get handed a gun, and, tell, and they tell you, "Kill this guy. Right. If you don't, we'll kill you." Who's uh, a lot of drugs or Chinese? Where the, are the, the, pre the precursors to make them? Yeah, a lot, a lot of precursors. That uh, are, I mean, that, a lot of the ingredients. A lot of the ingredients. Where are they physically being made? Uh, so uh, there's a place called they call Tierra, Tierra Caliente in Michoacan, which has traditionally been like the main hub of recent. Uh, you know, when I say recent, fifteen, twenty years uh, ago, there's been a lot of violence in that region. Uh, it used to be pot fields, and now it's gone back to poppy. So right. it's going back to heroin? Yeah. So the heroin has a long tradition in Mexico of uh, going back to the 40s. Uh, Second World War, you had a large uh, demand for opium on the U.S. side during the war. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that heroin was actually grown in Sinaloa. During uh, World War II. Yeah, during World War II. A lot of the uh, poppy fields that supplied that morphine uh, were grown in Sinaloa. Oh, morphine for the bath. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So a lot, that's, the, <clears throat> that's the first time you see kind of heroin in the area. And interestingly enough, so morphine was, is from the poppy. Yeah, it's, it's something you make from from uh, from from poppies. So the U.S. needs morphine. Yeah, like for all those. Whenever you see those World War II movies and the guy's all shot up on the ground and the guy pulls out the medic, you know, gives him the shot of um, morphine. Yeah, and that's being made in Mexico. The poppy seeds. They bring Chinese poppy fields. They br they bring some <clears throat> Chinese people in, and then they, they, that's that's how the grows get started. In in Mexico, in Mexico, and then <clears throat> the, the that the, the the idea gets implanted of heroin in Mexico. So there. the people in so it's the forties. It's World War Two. The climate is better for poppies. Perfect. There, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's, uh, specifically in Michoacan, it's just perfect. There's a perfect climate for it. I'm, so initially, the Americans are making morphine out of yeah. it, so no problemo. Then World War II ends. Yeah. We don't need so much morphine. Yeah. They, and the people in that vill in a village, that area, area, are going, well, wait a minute. We yeah. can make heroin can, out of this. Yeah. We could, still, we could still sell it. You know, right. And also marijuana uh, during the, uh, the mm -hmm. 60s and 70s. You know, mm -hmm. That uh, also became a thing. So that started getting grown out there as well. And what's the government do? Uh, eradication that. operations all over the area, stuff like that. But it's it's vast. P people have no idea how big Mexico is. Mexico is pretty big. You know, mm -hmm. I think there's a weird mental kind of block that a lot of people have as far as the size of Mexico. Mexico is a pretty big place. You know, um, so eradication campaigns. The military goes and cuts down a field and burns it. But then the cartels pay certain people in the in the government to not target them, target the other guys. Mm -hmm. So you get a tribalism going on. Right. A there used to be a large, a single large cartel group in Mexico. Now it's turned into a federation of them. And everything got, when it got segmented is that's where you start seeing the violence just come up. Right. Um, um, so going back to Michoacan where a lot of this stuff is uh, being grown, the current uh, heroin epidemic, you legalize pot in California, then Denver, Colorado, and all these places. So the 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 the, the investment in marijuana, illegal marijuana growth in Mexico just goes down. Right. So they have to look for an option. Right. So and that's where the heroin, heroin comes in. Heroin. And they add fentanyl in it because it's not the best heroin in the world. So they have to give it a little kick. So that's when the Chinese connection comes in as far as people from China, laboratories from China moving fentanyl into Mexico. Um. It's not good like you would get out of um, like Afghan, Afghan, or some. Yeah. It's not the same quality. You, you, the, the color changes. You could see it. Uh, it's like a lighter brown, lighter br brown color uh, in difference to some of the darker uh, color you, uh, heroin, stronger heroin you get, get from some of those regions. It has to do with the sun I, I, I've heard, or and the means that the uh, the ways that they prep it, because you know these are farmers, poor farmers that recently kind of rediscovered the whole process. So how. How scientific are these guys? I mean, <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's like you have the guys on the street making the tacos and you go, okay, where's the oversight? Yeah. Like where, how, how, how good are these, yeah. how clean, how whatever. 
But then you go, but well, that guy's a businessman. And if people start getting food poisoning, yeah. his business is going away. Yeah. So they, how are they with they, the cleanliness and the sanitation? And I, I mean, they're not running it like a lab, like American pharmaceutical company, but they also have a, vent, a, a vested interest in people not ODing or yeah. getting fucked up too much often, yeah, right? They have people that test it. They do. Yeah. So there's a, there's a large heroin epidemic in the regions where it's grown. And it's usually from people testing their product, right? Um, also, you, you, see, you saw, you know, back in the early 2000s, you saw a presence of Chinese lab guys working with the cartels to get some of the, start, uh, some of the lab laboratory started. So then you would see some of the things you would normally see, like in a lab, a pharmacy type lab setting, you see implied five guys in the cartels in the field somewhere kind of being, you know, as far as how they would clean and prep and how they would mix things. So you see this cross pollination of methodology from a purely Chinese uh, lab laboratory setting to somewhere in a field out there, you know, lacing uh, fentanyl into heroin. So the, the Chinese, as we keep hearing more and more, are making all the pharmaceuticals. So they have a strong history yeah. and, and, and and expertise in that and they'll do anything for money so they just send a few guys who have that background that chemistry background yeah, and pharmaceutical and background and they bring them to mexico it doesn't probably not as strong in that department but they'll grow the poppies and they'll do the protection and they'll distribute the stuff and these guys will work the labs yeah set them up show them how to yeah how much the, the fentanyl Physically, like, is it 10% fentanyl? Is it 40%? Do, do they know? Do you know? I have no idea what exactly the numbers are as far as the mixture goes. I just know that they do have somebody there that knows their, knows not to make a batch that's going to kill a bunch of people, right? Usually when you see things go lethal on this side of the border, it's because they, the product was cut and somebody decided to add more fentanyl into it on this side. That's where you see the epidemic of people kind of ODing up. There. Right. So somebody, they don't have a tamper-proof cap, cap on that no, thing when it no, goes to no. the dealer. So when people get the bad batch, it's because somebody got greedy on this side. Not It didn't leave the lab that way. No, no. no. <clears throat> it's, a, it's, not good, it's not good for business down there to do it like that. So usually you'll see some of the epidemics, and it's usually in certain places that these things have start, – people start ODing in certain places – and that's usually a distribution type uh, thing that happens where people start cutting things into it mm -hmm. to make more product out of a small batch. Right. And they add the fentanyl in it to make it, you know, work across. Right. Yeah. You know, what keeps the, the theme that sort of keeps coming back to me is it's just business, you yeah. know, for, for these guys. And, you know, we like to do a sort of cartoon versions of everybody, like big, bad and evil and whatever. But... It's basically business minus any scruples whatsoever. Yeah. It's just like yeah. I'm running a business and it, it'd just be like if we had sub sandwich places, except for if that guy opens across the street, I'm going to shoot him. Yeah. But it's still better. It's just business. It is. It it's is. like it's like business without any guardrails. Yeah. But in that world of business, people ODing on your product is not good business. Yeah. And taking down commercial jetliners not good business either no no they don't want to draw that much heat or attention you know um th there's there's you know th i'm going into theory and um you know rumor right now uh but uh during a time uh a lot of the a lot of the the, the cartel that grew the most was the sinaloa cartel post 9 11 era the sinaloa cartel is the one that grew the most and um you know, there was a big worry on the U.S. side that the, that uh, certain uh, Middle Eastern elements would use Mexico to go into or put things in the United States, like like a dirty bomb or or a group of people with AK-47s. That was kind of the prevailing kind of fear that happened. And we heard, you know, through the grapevine that cartel groups would you know, specifically be on the lookout for anybody Arab or mm -hmm. trying to get across with a coyote or something like that because they were not good for business. Right, right. So been, and you would you you would think about well, you know that that makes sense, and kind of that. So, in uh, from the U.S. point of view, they would that would be good to have, you know, a deterrent of that nature. Yeah. Um, so, you know, who it's, knows? It's business. Well, they must love all of us just arguing over 
you know, calling everyone, each other racist all the time over everything. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm trying to think what's bad for business. I guess bad for business is like Republican law and order, you know, governor or mayor or whatever, who's just constantly getting his ice guys whipped up and everything like that. And good for business. Got to be California. Yeah. So, so, so you saw the largest growth of the, the, the senior law cartel during a past Democratic administration. Mm. And then this new administration comes in and now you see a fragmented cartel group down there, which means you're going. So it, it grew under President Obama. Yeah. And a see, single my, one. Here's grew. my. My theory about Trump that uh, not many of my Hollywood friends share with me is I think when cartel leaders or banana republic leaders or all the evil doers, North Korea and China, Korea, China, all that stuff, I think when they see us with a very progressive – almost nice president. Like, I think they see like Hillary Clinton and they go, oh, we don't have to worry about her. She's not going to do anything to us. Like, she's going to do what she does, but she's not going to declare war on us. Like, and, and if you get a guy like Trump, you got a wild card. Yeah. You got a guy with a lot of bravado who may just fucking declare war on you and your business and your industry or your nation or, or whatever it is. And, it's not good for business. I just I feel like what they want is consistency, not volatility. So so, so I'll say this: on uh, they do fear the new the new the new uh, the new politics up here. Like specifically when they started saying things about declaring them a terrorist organization, they declaring the cartels a terrorist organization, um, and designating them a terrorist organization. And and the, one of the first things that happened when he came into power, El Chapo was extradited, and they saw this weird movement, and you saw f uh, fractioning. Of cartel uh, influence in Mexico directly as a response of the U.S.'s new uh, presidency, but on the one thing that canceled it out is the politics down there kind of changed as well, uh, from a full-on let's go after the cartels to a now let's uh, abrazos no balazos policy, which means hugs not bullets. So the government is basically saying, well, it's I it's no longer a problem, you know, right. So it's this, there's no drug war going on. So let's uh, focus on something else like corruption. Right. And I guess if you're in a cartel, you'd rather have that administration or Gavin Newsom here than Rudy Giuliani when he was 60 years yeah. old fucking going after everybody. He's a, the president down there is a, is a, a socialist, a public socialist. Now. Yeah. Well, again – it's just business. It is. And whatever's better for business. It is. That's, what's, that's what they want. It's interesting how it, they canceled each other out. You know, it led to the most bloody year of violence in Mexico. His presidency. Yeah. And it's not – it, it don't, people, people always say that it's because I'm, I have a preference or I have some sort of political – all past presidents in Mexico have been, you know, corrupt and they have corruption things. The whole, the whole system is flawed. On my end, right? But this one specifically, uh, his uh, policy of just basically just you know putting up his arms and saying there's no problem, basically a denial policy you know? led to a big uptick in violence and death. Yeah, uh, and also you know the cartel, the the traditional bigger cartel, Sinaloa you know, cartel, has been getting a fr it has been fractioning, so there's infighting there, and the new generation cartel is growing like a uh, like crazy. So well, look, um, is it? And, and don't agree with me for the sake of agreeing with me. Um, is it that much different than the homeless problem in Los Angeles where the mayor just kind of went like, I'm not going to clean the streets up. These guys, that's their property. I can't confiscate their property. Like, all the tough choices, all the moves that involve taking the homeless camp and doing this and all that stuff – our mayor just kind of went like, ah, he threw his arms up. He just went like, they're, come on, let's not be mean. This is not a, you know, they're okay. They're, they're, they're regular. First thing he did is just turn them into regular folk. These are like hardworking folk that just missed a payment and their uh, rent was due. And now they're sleeping under there. He fucking took the whole thing, turned it into, hey, these are good folks. These are just neighbors that are down on their luck and blah, blah, blah. Okay. 
you blink your eyes and the problems yeah. 10 times worse. Yeah. I mean, I, I, because I, you didn't do anything. I've walked around Skid Row and I've <clears> seen <throat> some of that. And I'm, you know, uh, with law enforcement guys, I saw some of the heroin that we're using, which I know where it came from, you know, um, saw some of the, some of the, you know, I, I started a business when I first came up here and it started in California. Uh, it's not in California anymore because of, you know, it's a pretty rough place to start a business, California. Well, you're trying to run a business just like the cartels yeah. are. It's, <laughs> it's, it's good for the cartels. It's bad yeah. if you pay taxes. Yeah. And uh, I saw that and it was like, you know, million dollar apartment over there and uh, yeah, the Hep C and that needle over there. It's again, the, the, if you start, uh, if you stop uh, obeying the small rules, you know, the big ones up top, eventually, you'll eventually get to, to those big ones up top and you know, Broken that's, that's how you start. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you, <clears throat> sorry, my throat's getting hoarse. Um, I'm going to tease a question for you on that. Dr. Drew's brought it up. I probably brought it up to you before, but um, I don't see a lot of Hispanic homeless people here. I see everything. Well, no, I see lots of white, fair amount of black, but I don't see that many Hispanic. Drew's brought it up a few times. I think it's kind of because of the family structure. It's not like we got a shortage of Mexicans here, they, and they're poor. I want your sort of cultural take on that. <clears throat> For, all right, Ed Calderon, uh, homelessness culturally. Uh, you know, uh, you know, or what have you seen? Well, you know, personally, personally, I get surprised by overweight homeless people with smartphones. <laughs> Yeah. As a Mexican, as a Mexican, right. I'm like, wow, that's pretty interesting. Patty with a smartphone sleeping for free on yeah. the sidewalk. And, uh, you know, you see a lot of mental health and stuff like that. We have homeless in Mexico as well, and it's usually drug related, and they're usually very skinny, and they usually don't have a family nucleus around them. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, Mexico is very big on family. Um, also, you know, Mexican work, work ethic is. You know, there's still corporal punishment down there in a family uh, in a family setting. You know, um, so you got to work, or you're going to get the yeah, flip, you're going to get a harachi upside your ass. Oh uh, yeah, the big you know the chancla or the car antenna or the you know extension cord. There's a, there's a few. There's a few of them. You know? What's a chancla? A chancla is a, a, a sandal. Mm. Know? Moms, Mexican moms are very good at kicking off their sandal and just throwing it. Or oh, they can do it one motion. Oh, yeah, they're there. Yeah. So that's it's, it's some superpower stuff, you know. Um, but yeah, why? Why very? There are you know, you know Latin American Latin American guys out there that are homeless. But uh, you know, straight off the uh, straight off the crossing, you know, the work ethic is different. Oh, uh, there's. I, I get a kick out of hearing some of the some of the second or third generation Mexican uh, nationals up here, um, Americans, uh, kind of complaining about racism up here. Mexicans are really racist, like as a culture, like we're really we have uh, blackface uh, uh, comedy skits on TV still. Really? Yeah. Huh. Uh, the uh, the uh, coronavirus thing. There's piñatas with the coronavirus of uh, the coronavirus <laughs> yeah. with a Chinese uh, caricature. Really? Hat on there. Wow. You can look that up. That's pretty hilarious. Uh, uh, well, and you, and and then when you when there, we had a president that said, you know, Mexicans do the job that not even black people want to do in the U.S. That's what mm -hmm. he would say. Right? We had a president that said right. that type of stuff. So when we come up here and uh, the, the work ethic is, you know, you need to you need to work, you need to do whatever you need to do to bring send money back home, make a life up here, and just figure it out, right? When I got up here, it was the same. Uh, most of the people that I that I know that are on the same boat that, boat as I am are the same. You know, you're just trying to find a way to to work and to earn it. Right? Yeah, ethic is interesting because. If you know anything about the culture, and um, I do because I work so much construction out here. And when you work construction out here, <clears throat> that's all you do is work with Mexican guys. That's it. Yeah. Never work with a black person ever. A Hand, handful of white guys, almost no Jews, no, no Japanese, almost no Asian whatsoever. And no Nordic guys or anything. It's like it's Hispanic guys. And a couple of white dudes who didn't do that well in high school. That's that's who it is. And these guys fucking know how to work. Yeah, they work. Yeah. They understand work. Yeah. And they're and it's even funnier if you hang around long enough and you work with some of the dudes for a lot of years, like I have. You start noticing that their kids or their nephews or their whatever 
have a much worse work ethic than they do. Here's a guy, 55, 60 years old, doesn't miss a day, and is just stacking cinder block all day. And you get his 19-year-old nephew a job, and he's got a scratch in his throat, and he's missing a few days. Yeah. You know, so it's like they're even within that group, there's an ethic like you spoke of. Yeah, a, a trade skills. Uh, when I was like, when I, my dad has a uh, machine shop. He makes um, uh, electrical transformers and stuff like that in Mexico. And I learned how to weld when I was a kid. He took, he would take me to you know work with him. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew about plumbing because in Mexico you don't call it plumber. You do it yourself, you right? Know? And, and you know, you watch your dad do it, and then you do it, right? Right, and. Uh, Something about uh, solutions being easy up here. You know, things are just a phone call away, right? Mm -hmm. you know, something happens, ah, call the plumber. Like, no, I can, I can, I, I can fix it. No, I just call the plumber. Yeah. Well, it's right? interesting. You know, I guess we've come full circle because we're talking about the sort of immune system and you have to kind of have that sort of junkyard dog immune system mutt. And we have more of the purebred lap dog. And, my kids are growing up like the lap dog, and I grew up like the junkyard dog, not with the immune system, well, with the immune system, but also with the work ethic. These older dudes, they grew up just wor fucking working. That's all, that's all they did. That's how I grew up. My kids are not that. Evidently, their kids are not that either. And just like their immune system, they, they got weaker. Yeah. All, all the air conditioning and all the cell phones and all the cable TV made them softer. I, I get the uh, trying to trying to sh uh, shelter your kids from the hardship that you experience, right? So like, I don't I don't want my kid to do what I did, at right? All. No donkey shows, no and, none of that, right? None find of that the bodies at the park, tattooed in your mind. No, that's not not. But um, you know, when she was five, she got a pocket knife uh, for, as a gift because that's her uncles are weird like me, and she took it to school and and proceeded to do a demonstration on how to make a fire bow. Basically, a survival skill. Is this who's this? Sorry? It's my kid. Your daughter. It's a five year old. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, the parents were shocked and horrified. Sure, uh, that she had a weapon. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's Swiss Army knife. Listen, I I try to fucking explain to everybody. You know, when people go, there's no such thing as too safe. It's like, yes, there is. There there is a danger. That danger is turning your kid into a fucking pussy. <laughs> it's a very real yeah. danger and it's a fucking lifetime sentence yeah and you'll fuck them up royally if you do this shit and explain to them that everything's a danger and everything's got to be 100 percent safe and you never it's never okay to walk i mean my 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 wife said to me yesterday uh your daughter and her friend they want to walk up from the trail at night and walk home whatever is that okay? And I was like, I, why are you even asking me? Of course it's okay. They do everything. Do as much as you can. You don't realize how dangerous fear is and how dangerous. Go find some adult who's fear-based. Tell me how they're doing. Yeah. Tell me how they're doing in business. Tell me how they're doing in life. Tell me how they're doing personally. Find me a fear-based adult and you tell me if they're flourishing because I guarantee they're not. Yeah. And you fucking ruin them with safety. So there is a great danger to safety. Yeah, I mean, you, uh, you know, somebody, the, one of the parents said, "What if she gets cut with that knife?" And then she'll learn a valuable lesson. Learn which side's the sharp side <laughs> of the blade? Learn, yeah, she'll learn a valuable lesson, and she also knows how to, uh, you know, how to patch up a wound if she has to. Like she's, she's a uh, that's, and it's not even me being. I'm gonna be extra because this is what I know. It's just me being who my mom raised me to be, right? And I think that's missing uh, that uh, we tr we we tend to stop transmitting uh, through experience, and we want to shield our kids or the people we love from you know getting a you know broken nose. <laughs> I'm everything. I'm I'm with you, Ed. Uh, the website edsmanifesto.com is where you go. Um, now I think we'll do a whole third round on uh, parenting. <laughs> Uh, can I uh, just show you one thing really quick? Oh, the donkey? Oh, let's see. Wait, wait, just so you, just when people ask you oh, about sorry. it. Let me see. Ah. Oh, that's a don oh, that is a donkey show. Wow. You're right. She is facing the front. It's 
she's she got quite a gut on her there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, wow. That's so now, uh, it's real. That's, that's real. What, oh man, is that real? <laughs> that's as real as it gets. Uh, <clears throat> later on in life, I, I realized why she was dressed like Ezra Rabbit. Hmm. The, the donkey's supposed to be Roger Rabbit. Oh, I never, I never <laughs> did that math. But I guess I never had to. That's horrible. Oh, that woman's probably grandmother now. Is she probably a grandmother here still? You know, oh, already. yeah, she probably was then. You're right. <laughs> You're right. All right. Uh, let's see. Go to amcrola.com.